there's a passage in the 16th chapter of John, and Jesus is standing with his disciples, his friends, really, and he says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And you know, that phrase is kind of a mystery to me. How, how do we, what does that mean to us we're, when we're right in the middle of trouble? What does it mean for us to take heart? But I looked at that phrase and actually, I think one of the reasons why Jesus said take heart is because he had said it before. In fact, when the woman who wanted to reach and touch Jesus's garment, when she touched his robe, he turned around and saw her, he said, take heart heart, your faith has healed you. And when the paralyzed man, when his friends brought him to Jesus and Jesus met him, he said, take heart for your sins are forgiven. And when the disciples were huddled together on the boat, scared out of their minds, and Jesus came from across the ocean walking toward them, he said, take heart, it's me. And I feel like take heart is this thing that Jesus keeps saying almost as a a symbol or a way for us to remember that he's with us. In fact, the only way I feel like I can really take heart in this world with all the unknowns and all of the pain and all of the sorrow is knowing that God is with me and knowing that God is the wounded healer, that Jesus is a God who suffers with us. He doesn't heal us from far away, but he comes very close. And there's nothing that we endure in this life that he doesn't go first and he doesn't go with us so that's how we can hear that voice in our darkest hour wherever we are we can hear Jesus saying take heart I'm with you I've overcome the world Hear all you children of heaven's promise Shivering under clouds of gloom Hear all you wondering where your God is Jesus weeps tonight with you Take heart Take heart, he is overcome the world. Take heart, take heart, he is overcome the world. Hear all you weary, troubles companion. Praying to find a peace unknown Where sorrows river Hollow the canyon The wounded healer's water flows Take heart Take
great new song. What a great new song. You know, welcome everybody to Central Community Church of God's online worship service. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together. Just have fellowship. You know, the Bible says this in James 5, 16. It says, it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Isn't it wonderful that we can come together here in the house of the Lord? here on this online worship service to have community to have fellowship see god's intention is just for this time to be a, a safe time for us to share our struggles to join one another interest in intercession and encouragement jesus also says in matthew 18 20 says for where two or three gather as my followers i am there among them god is here in our midst now as we sing our songs of praise and worship our king we want to welcome you all today to this place where you can find fellowship and community. We're here as a body of believers to lift each other up and to serve one another. You know, you're not here by accident. I don't believe that. I believe that God desires to speak to each one of you today through powerful worship and message that is going to be presented. I encourage you to keep your hearts open and ask God what he wishes to say to you today at church. If you're a visitor or a first time uh, watcher here on our online service, we're so glad to have you join us this morning. Let's pray. Blessed Lord, you are the King of heaven and earth. All of heaven, Lord, sings of your glory and you do wonders on earth and in heaven. We seek the work of your hands as we gather and worship this morning. Lord, accept our prayers in Jesus' name. Do not forsake us as we strive to live our lives in honor of you. We have gathered in fellowship in your presence. So, Lord, come down and allow us to feel your presence as we continue this service today. We want to feel your great power and light. Let us encounter you in new ways and bless us in our lives. And may we find everlasting joy through you. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. This glorious morning. Amen. Amen. Let's join together now, folks. Let's join together now in praise and worship. Um, I don't know about you, but um, this time has been one where I've just realized how uh, uncertain life is and um, just kind of felt, I think we're all feeling the shaking of like kind of just our convenient life and our normal thing um, getting all mixed up. And um, I think if there's anything I feel this endless longing for is to like feel like how do I you know be sure of anything uh as we're all like what's true and just grasping with everything that's going on right now um I'm like I need something to hold on to and uh and I wanted to just offer this uh as something we can hold on to tonight uh, from Romans uh chapter 8 verse 31 what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. 
Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are like sheep being brought to the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. My friend in troubled times when enemies are on every side you take my hand you are my guide you lead me through the great divide and I will not be no I will not be afraid no I will not be, no, I will not be afraid. For this I know, you will be with me where I go. You will be with me where I go. You will be with me where I go. Oh, this I know, you will be with me where I go. You will be with me where I go. You will be with me. 
my soul from this, my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the land of the living. My soul from this, my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the land of the living. I love you, Lord, for you have delivered me. Stumbling, I will walk in the land of the living. My soul from death, my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the land of the living. Hey folks, welcome to our second part of Bless, the Beatitudes, part two. We're talking a little bit about Matthew 5, verse 4 today. And it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, it's as I said earlier when we first started, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. It's great for you to have you join us here online. It's great to, you know, we're very thankful that you've taken the time to join us. We really are. You know, we never take for granted our gathering together to make much of Jesus. Never forget that we gather to build up, to encourage one another, and worship our Lord and Savior. Last week we began a series called Blessed, the Beatitudes. We're talking about the things, the habits of our lives. And I began last week by asking you, have you ever asked yourself this question? Why do I do the things I do? Why do I keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again? I use the Apostle Paul as an example. In Romans, he talks about this very same thing. Paul says he confuses himself. He doesn't understand the things he does. He doesn't do the things he knows he should do. He does the opposite, and he's wondering, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Well, I found a video. It's a short little video. I'm going to play it for you. And it only lasts a few seconds, okay? And, it, there, and there's, there's very little sound to it. But I think you might get the point of what I'm talking about about a sheep and how, how the sheep might lose its way. Let's check the video out. Mm. <laughs> 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 
Нет, против солнца. Poor sheep. Honestly, does that describe your life? Does that describe your life? Does that describe my life just a little bit? In all those hurts and all those habits and all those hang-ups in our life, man, they just overwhelm us sometimes, don't they? We can spend a lifetime trying to get past them. You know, God has given us His Word to help us beat these things that keep us from experiencing the life He wants to give us. Do you know that in John 10, Jesus says this in John 10, 10b, he says this, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The New Living Translation, which I usually use here in the church, says this, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. See, that's a promise from Jesus himself. I wonder how we're doing with that. I wonder if we're actually claiming that. You know, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. If we're claiming that rich free, full, satisfying life. Well, I'm here to tell you, well, no, no, let me stop. Let me stop. I'm not here to tell you. God's word is here to tell you that that kind of life is possible. Oh, it's possible. It's possible. And there's a world to come where all will be set right. But even here and now, God's word promises that we can experience life the way God intended. And His Word shows us that. Folks, His Word shows us that. It proves that to us. We're looking, like I said, right now, we're looking at the Beatitudes. Eight qualities help us understand understand God's principles of how God wants us to act and how God wants us to be. After all, He's our Creator, right? He's our Creator. Who would know best how we can work than our Creator? Who would know better? Only our Creator. He sets out right at the beginning of what's called the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. And it's found in Luke as well. These eight different qualities. These qualities are systematic. They're progressive. As we said last week, they go one by one. You can't do one and skip and go without doing the other. You have to go in order. It has to be done in that way. You can't just jump around and pick and choose the ones that you want. It doesn't work that way. They also sound a lot different from what the world teaches us. And what the world expects around us. They're really utterly contrary to what the world says. And three, you have to understand what the word blessed means. Each beatitude begins with this word, blessed. Blessed. Or blessed. Like last week we talked about how blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So when we think of the word blessed, we often think of favor of good things happening to us. We're living an encouraging life, so we're blessed. And then because of that, we have a result. But here's the definition that you all need to understand, that we all need to understand. When Jesus used the word blessed, he talked about how God sees us as blessed when this happens in our lives. In other words, from last week when we're poor in spirit, when we come to God with empty hands, when we recognize that He is our Creator, and that we bring nothing to Him. Jesus says you're blessed. Yeah, Jesus says you're blessed. You're blessed because you recognize your dependency upon Him. You recognize how desperate we are in need of God. When we do that, the result is then the kingdom of heaven. You are blessed. God's rule and reign in our life begins to materialize. It begins to come about. It begins to bear fruit. And that word, that's what the word blessed means. Blessed are those who recognize that they are desperately in need of a Savior. Man, that they are sinners without any possible hope of saving themselves. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This week as we go to number two, the second beatitude, you can, you can kind, kind of call it the, the gladness of sadness. <laughs> if you want to understand that. Matthew 5 verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, how many of you feel blessed when you're mourning? How many of you feel, wow, I'm mourning. Oh, this is, this is awesome. This is great. When we think of mourning, we think of something that we've lost. Perhaps someone we have lost, don't we? Of course, we have grief and mourning, and that's highly appropriate. It really is. 
We're to grieve when we lose something or, or someone. We are to mourn. But Jesus isn't talking about that kind of mourning, folks, or that kind of grieving. When he says, blessed are those who mourn or are unhappy, he's talking about grieving and mourning. Now listen carefully. Over our sin. Number one, we recognize that we are poor in spirit, right? Two, that, and number two, that drives us to our knees and we mourn the fact that we are sinners. Our sin should grieve us, that we're sinners. It should grieve us. It should cause us to mourn. We should be in a sense of mourning, it says, as we recognize that sin in our life. You see, we have become desensitized to sin, I think. We don't even like to use the word sin. We like to use different words, and you'll hear it throughout our society. And that word we usually use instead of sin is the word mistake. I don't sin any longer. I make mistakes. And everybody makes mistakes. Making a mistake. Well, of course I make mistakes. I'm human. I'm human. You can see this all throughout our culture. Nobody said, Nobody says, hey, I'm a sinner. No. Instead, I've made some mistakes. I've made some mistakes. Well, you look at some people and you look at some things that have occurred. And if you're like me, you say to yourself, I don't know. I don't know about that. This is a lot bigger than a mistake. This is something that's much bigger than just a mistake in judgment or error. No, no. This comes down to the root of who we are and what God's word tells us that all of us that all of us are sinners. We're not people who make mistakes. Oh, we do make mistakes, but we are sinners, okay? We are sinners. There's a pastor, his uh, name is Vadi Bosham, and he's an educator, he's a pastor, he's a teacher, he's a preacher, educator, like I said. He says, we don't think we need to be saved anymore, we just need to be helped. We don't need good news of the gospel, we just need good advice. See, to that, Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's wrong. Until you learn that your sin has separated you from God, the Father, that God is holy, and just, well, listen carefully, you cannot tolerate sin, that you will never be comforted until you recognize that. You'll never have the comfort that comes from the recognition of our sins until we begin to mourn for our sins. You see, it works together as we recognize how desperate we are. And then we mourn for our sins. Now, all of you understand. Let me give you an illustration. All of you, especially you parents out there, you know when your children do something wrong, isn't there a difference when they come back to you and say, well, I'm sorry, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry. And you can just tell when they say that, they're not really sorry. Maybe they're sorry, it's no big deal. But there's, a diff- but there's a difference when they're really sorrowful, isn't there? They're re- when they're really mourning, when they really grieve over what they've just something they've just done. And that's what Jesus is talking about, you see? It's easy to say, oh Lord, I made a mistake. Please forgive me. It's another thing, it, it, it's that next step that our sin that dri- that our sin drives us to our knees, okay? Or if you have a friend or a friend at work or just a friend that you've had a long time and they wrong you. And here's what we enjoy saying. If I've hurt you in any way, I'm sorry. If you're like me, you wonder, if you don't understand that you hurt me, are you sorry? I mean, conditionally, if I've hurt you. No, no, you hurt me deeply. You hurt me deeply. It's when we mourn over that, when it really, really hurts. And you know you've really hurt somebody. It's when we mourn over that. And that's the point that Jesus is making for us is we will become more and more like Him. That's the point Jesus makes. If we want to be blessed, we must spend time mourning and grieving over the severity of our sin if we want to receive comfort. Not just make not just not just mistakes, but this thing that we have moved, this thing that we've moved away from God when we sin. You see, because of our sin, it's 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 our sin that caused Jesus to come in the first place. It's our sin that required Jesus' life. It's our sin, folks. It's our sin. Not our mistakes. It's our sin. In fact, we have denied and walked away from God. It's our sin. 
that sent Jesus Christ to that cross is our sin. Until we grasp a hold of that, until that causes us to fall to our knees, we never experience the comfort of forgiveness. We have to understand just how deep our sin is and just how much it grieves God. We like to make excuses and be like, well, it wasn't that bad. I'm not as bad as so-and-so over there. I'm not that bad. See, but folks, but all of our sin is grievous to God. So the question once again, does your sin grieve you? Do you mourn? 2 Corinthians 10, 7 verse 10 says this. It says, for the kind of sorrow that God wants us to have, the kind, we're saying the kind of grief, the kind of mourning that we need to have, leads us away from sin and results in salvation. Okay? Or in other words, as it says in the, in, in the NIV, it says this. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, it says this. It says, godly sorrow, which what's saying is the kind of grief, the kind of mourning that we need to have, brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Man. It's the kind of sin that you see in Scripture where you see the tax collector and the Pharisee are standing there and the tax collector, the tax collector says, like in Luke 18, 13, God have mercy on me, a sinner. A sinner. He can't even lift up his eyes. He can't even lift up his eyes. He's crying and begging for God's forgiveness. And the Pharisee says over the Lord, he says in verse 11, he says, Lord, he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like those other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. You see the difference? Of course. Jesus says until we mourn, until we grieve, we cannot experience the salvation and the comfort that he has for us until we recognize the severity of our sins. Our sins should cause us to grieve. This should cause us to really fall upon our knees before our holy God and say, Lord, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am a sinner. And how desperately I need you now, Lord. And then that's when the promise kicks in. Folks, that's when the promise kicks in. Is when we do that, when we're sincere in our hearts, the, world te the Word tells us that we, that we can experience comfort and consolation that comes only from our Father God. In Luke, Jesus talks about this when He goes to teach at a synagogue, and He quotes from Isaiah 61, and He says this, in Luke 4, 18 and 19, He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me, now this is Jesus talking, He has sent me to proclaim the, that the captives, and you see that word captives, will be released, and the blind will see, and the oppressed will be set free. And that, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. It's when God was ready to give. It's when God was ready to give His blessings to all who come to Him. Comfort is available to everyone who's broken by their sin. Everyone who recognizes that they have sinned before a holy God. Jesus comes, and He brings comfort to us. He comes and He and He can heal us, and He can restore us. And that's when we experience this great, great joy, folks. That's when we experience this great joy because we recognize that, wow, man, we don't deserve any of this. And yet God gives it to us completely and freely over and over and over again. You know that? God forgives us over and over and over. He forgives us for all the things that we do. He forgives us freely and completely and instantly and repeatedly. It's like that silly old sheep from that video. Take him out and he drops right back in there again. We're jumping in that same hole over and over again and that shepherd comes and pulls us out again and again and again and again. That's just like you and me. We're no different from that sheep. You see, if we confess, then Jesus forgives freely. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, from all wickedness, from all those things that are wrong. It's given to you and it's given to me freely and completely. Man, but we, have, but we must be a people. And I know I'm repeating myself because this is so important though, folks. 
We must be a people. We will never experience God's comfort. We will never experience God's joy. We will never experience God's peace. We will never experience all that God wants us to be in plans for us until we mourn and grieve over our sin. But once we do that, the comfort and the peace of God is available. God comes and He picks us up and He forgives us not only freely, but He forgives us completely. Completely for our past sins, for our present sins, even for our sins to come. He stands and He washes us clean because we recognize, hey Lord, I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Because you recognize that you come with empty hands, because you have grieved, you have now become, and now listen to this, isn't this great? Now you have become a new person. Man, you have become a new person. That old life of yours is gone and a new life has begun. Brother Corey, this is what I'm talking about you, brother. And we have people here in our church, the same thing that they just went through in a baptism. That old life is gone. You have become a new person and a new life has begun. Folks, let me tell you, especially you folks watching now online, Never, ever take that for granted. God gives us a new life, a new life in Christ, a life like none other, a life to be filled. He changes our hearts. He changes who we are, and our sins are forever forgiven. And it's a wonderful and awesome thing to have our sins forgiven, isn't it? I mean, freely and completely and utterly instantly. You see, this is the good news. I don't have to do a lot of work. You don't have to do a lot of work. Most of, our, most of us, we recognize that we are messed up and broken people, don't we? We know that. Sometimes we think we have to do all the stuff to make God forgive us and love us. But folks, I'm here to tell you, the Bible is here to tell you that that is not true. Even on the cross, when the thief on the cross was dying, he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. He didn't have a chance to do anything. He didn't have a chance to do work for his good. He didn't have a chance. He's up on a cross. He's going to die. There's no opportunity. Death was knocking at his door. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, I assure you. I assure you. I promise. I mean, think about that. You're dying on the cross. You recognize your sins have put you up on that cross. You're being justly, you're justly being sacrificed because you are a thief and you have done horrible things in your life. And you hear these words from the Lord of Lords. He says, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Man, I mean, wouldn't that just blow your mind? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Here, that's what happens to us when we grieve over our sins because we know that our sins have, have separated us from God. And as we do that, He forgives us completely. He forgives us instantaneously. He says, your sins are all washed away, Malcolm. I didn't mark this down in my notes, but it's so important. It also says, He remembers them no more. He remembers them no more. And I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad that you don't count my sins against me. Because I remember every one of them. I remember every one of them. But folks, Jesus doesn't dwell on them. It's instant. It's completely. It's forgiven. It's called the grace of God. The grace of God. I mean, friends, if you're joining me online as well, how great is our God? How great is our God? I mean, how great is our God? Because He forgives us even this way. Imagine, imagine this repeatedly. Over and over and over again. Because you and I are just like that silly video of that sheep that showed at the very beginning. That sheep plopping itself in that same thing over and over, that same hole over and over. They didn't show this, but what that, that uh, shepherd or uh, farmer should have done, should have gone out and pulled that sheep out of the second hole he was in, and then maybe the third or the fourth, and over and over and over again. How do we know that? Because God's Word tells us that. 
Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, came to Jesus. Get Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, came to came to Jesus, and he said, "Hey, Lord, how many times should I forgive people? I mean, surely there must be an end to this." And Peter was feeling pretty pretty generous and pretty smug. He said, "Should I forgive people as much as seven times? I mean, that's a lot of times, Lord." Seven times for the same thing over and over and over again. Haven't you said this about friends of yours that ask for forgiveness? But here, listen to this. How does Jesus respond? No, no, no. Jesus says no, not seven times, Peter, but seventy times seven. Of course, Jesus isn't asking Peter to do the math and multiply it. Or you mean he's like, oh, what do you mean, like four hundred ninety times, and that's then that's it? No, no. It's as an analogy. Jesus is using that as an illustration to say again and again and again and again and again and again. That's why our God is great. That's why He forgives us. That's why He has comfort. When I stand before God, the Creator of the universe, when I'm standing before Him, I am alone, and I'm standing there, and I know that I will stand in peace and in comfort because He has paid the price for my sins, for my sins. My sins and your sins and our sins can be forgiven completely, instantly, repeatedly. We become this new creation. I mean, I want you to see the connection between the first beatitude of those who are poor and those who recognize how poor they are to the point where they are mourning how broke they really are. Picture, if, picture this, if you will. It's payday. Your bills have been paid. It's Friday. You call up your friends and tell them to come and pick you up. You're going to go out for a night on the town. You make a promise that everyone's going to have fun, and your promise is, "Man, I feel so good. I'm going to pay for everything. I'm going to foot the bill for this." After your after your friends are excited about your promise to come and pick you up, you ask them to take take you by the ATM, the bank machine, so that you can go get some cash. And you walk around. You put your you put in your card. You push for your withdrawal, only to discover that you can get. No cash. You immediately discover that your account has zero balance. You call your bank, only to discover that the IRS has garnished your wages. You immediately contact the IRS, and the agent informs you that the next three months your entire check is going to be going directly to them. Oh man! You immediately ask, "Well, what about my mortgage or my rent?" The agent in the roundabout says, "Well, that's not my problem." You say, "What about my bill?" In a practical sense, the first beatitude would say, in a response, "I'm broke." Right? The second beatitude goes back to the car after leaving the ATM and mourns to the point of admitting your despair. And verse three, it says, "It says, I acknowledge that I need God." Verse four says, "I mourn because I tried to live without Him." Verse three says, "You see that you're more, you're spiritually bankrupt." And back to the fourth verse, you mourn over how you have wasted your life. Verse four is the intellectual verse. The you know you need God verse. And verse four is the emotional verse. Emotional verse. You mourn because you tried to make it without Him. And that is when He says, "Okay, Malcolm, I'll give you comfort. What I worry about is people. Is I, what I worry about is not people who don't sin, but people who have been comfortable with sin without conscience." They go through the day. They curse somebody out. They lie. They cheat. They steal. They shoot the dog. They kick the cat. They go home. They get in bed and go to sleep and never talk to God about any of that whatsoever. They never talk to God about that any、uh, about it whatsoever. And it's only when it affects us is there some sense of remorse or contrition, right? But God says you ought not to not just be mournful over the results of sin. You ought to be. You ought to mourn over the nature of sin. Sin's not a blessing; it's a burden, folks. Sin's not a cure; it's a cancer. Sin's not a pleasure; it's a problem. Sin is not your company; it's the culprit. He says it ought to bother you. That sin is a problem in your life, Malcolm. Charles, in book Allen, in his book God's Psychiatry, tells about Father Damien, who for 13 years was a missionary to help the lepers on Molokai in, in, the, in Hawaii. And finally, this dread disease of leprosy lays, laid a hold of Father Damien. One morning, he spilled some boiling water on his foot, but there was not the slightest pain. And that's when he knew he was doomed. 
he said that he knew that death had come to his body and little by little, death would take possession. He said that it would have been a hundred times better for him if he, had, if he would have had that boiling water, if, the, if that boiling water had brought him pain. See, in Ephesians 4.19, Paul tells us of certain people who were past feeling, or they had no sense of shame. In fact, it says they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. And a sign, of God, a sign that God will bring comfort to you is if you feel the pain of, boiling, of the boiling nature of your own sin. If you feel the sin that, you're, that, that, that you have inside you. It's a divine conscience and almost a misery that keeps you humble and centered. It's what lets you know that you're not perfect, that you've not arrived, that you aren't there, and ultimately that you need God, as we all do. Socrates described a man's conscience as a wife that refuses to give you a divorce. There are some who couldn't divorce our conscience, but we just give it a melody to, to not where now your mischief just sounds like music instead of what it really is. There's a story of another man whose feet were amputated, who later told of his experience. He was caught out in the bitter cold of the far north. So long as his feet hurt and pained him, he was happy. But after a while, the pain was gone, and he knew then that his feet were doomed. The pain diminished as his feet froze. And Jesus gives us div this divine paradox that says, as long as I'm in pain, I'm happy. And here's my, here's my question. What about you? Have you committed a certain wrong? Does it hurt? And Jesus says, then be glad. Be glad. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. But what he's looking for is the one who knows that they haven't arrived yet, but they need God. And before you can ever expect the good news of salvation, you must first accept the bad story of sin. You have to. So we need to grieve and grieve over our sins. But not just our sins as well. I have a few little action steps for you, and this is important. We need to spend time with God and ask God to give us, give us God, a godly sorrow, a recognition. And in your quiet time, mourn for your sin and the sin of the world that we live in. You see, sin, we become so desensitized to it, it doesn't grieve us like it really needs to, I'm afraid. When we look at the world around us, when we see all the chaos, the anger, and my gosh, the hatred, we tend to just get caught up in it, don't we? We see ourselves doing that very same thing. It should, as Christ's followers, take us to, a, take us to our knees, folks. And we ought to grieve over all that sin because it grieves our God, our Heavenly Father. It grieves Him to see us like this. We need to ask the Lord to give us a heart for lost people. Those people that you read on Facebook or any of the other uh, internet sites or any other places or at your work or at the place of employment or your homes, whatever, you know who they are, who you disagree with, who you get angry with. You need to ask the Lord to, to give you a heart that helps, that helps them and helps you understand, helps all of us understand. No, it only comes from having a heart that's sensitive to that Holy Spirit. It should drive us. It should drive us. You know, when Jesus was looking over at Jerusalem, over, over, when he was looking over Jerusalem just before his crucifixion, what did he do? He wept over that entire city because he knew that that city would be destroyed. He knew that it would be torn down. And the sins of the people in Jerusalem caused him to weep. The sins of the people in Jerusalem caused him to weep. The sins in our community, the sins around us, the sins in our country should cause us to weep. We should take those before God, a holy and righteous God, and we should grieve over those sins. But when we do, God will send His comfort. And we'll become, all of us will become more and more like Jesus. And that's my prayer. That's my prayer. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for our church. That's a prayer, my prayer for you watching right now. That's a prayer for the community in which every one of us live. That we will become more and more like Jesus. But understanding the severity of our sin and grieving over it. And then thirsting, which is for next week, for righteousness and mercy. 
And as we do that, folks, as we do that, God, who is so great and who is so good, so powerful, so strong, He will bring you comfort. You know, the more we suffer, the Word tells us that the more we suffer for Jesus, the more we grieve, the more comfort we will receive through Jesus. We can never outgive the Lord. Never. Here's what I can promise you as you grieve and mourn over your sin. As you grieve and mourn over the sins of the people in the world around you, as you grieve over the sin and it drives you to your knees, God, who is faithful and just, will send you comfort. And that comfort will, will follow with peace and joy. And you'll experience life, which is rich and free and abundant. Well, it may not be the life that the world tells us to cling for, but it's the life of joy and freedom that comes from being with Jesus Christ and your relationship with Him. Friends, there is no God like our God. There's no God like Him. Man, He extends His hand of comfort and mercy and justification and forgiveness and freedom. And all we have to do is ask and be sincere and repent. That's it. And we, as we recognize God's hand in our lives, He will fill us all with comfort all the countenance that we need, and He will walk with us through the valleys and the high points and all the stages of our lives. That's how great our God is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for the truth of Your Word. Lord, we praise You with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, and strength. We know that in all the world there is no one like You. So God, Lord, we pray, come into our lives. We thank you that you forgive us completely, instantly, freely, over and over again. May we rejoice, Lord, in who you are. And may we rejoice in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Hey folks, before we get to the closing prayers, a few announcements I want to make. And don't forget, Thursday nights at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, join us for our Zoom fellowship and prayer time. You're all welcome to join us. It's a great time of fellowship and Bible study. We're going, to, <clears throat> we're going through the book of Romans, and it's just been blessed. It's just been a blessed time since we started this just before Christmas. It's been absolutely wonderful. And I really encourage you all to come on in. Come in with your Bibles, come in with your questions, anything at all you we think you can help we can help you with, or perhaps you can help us with. We don't have all the answers. We're hoping you can join in and give us that we can all do the search together. So come and join us, 6:30 p.m. every Thursday night on our Zoom fellowship. The number is right above my head. Get the Zoom app for your phone, your tablet, or your, your laptop, and uh, uh, get the Zoom app and just and just type in this number right above my head. And that'll take you right to the room and I'll admit you. And you're more than welcome. We 6:30 to 8 p.m. We just joined. If you have prayer requests, is all. Just or you just need to listen to some good conversation and join in. Man, we'd love to have you with us. We really would love to have you with us. So come and join us for that. Also, don't forget ten o'clock Sunday mornings. You can watch us on our YouTube channel, which is a great place to start. You can go to our website, which is www.centralcommunitychurchofgod.net. All of the videos are there. Plus, the new one each week will be live at ten a.m. Each ten a.m. You can go there. It's a, it's a YouTube link. Or you can join us on Facebook because the links will be on our Facebook page for the YouTube channel. And then later in that same day, the actual video would be presented, usually sometime after uh, 12 o'clock. It'll be, it'll be downloaded and let, uh, loaded onto our Facebook page. So you're more than welcome to join us in any of those ways too. But more than that, we'd love to have you join us here at 1100 North Reddington Street in Hanford, California. In, Han in Hanford, California. We'd love to have you join us here. Okay, we really would. We've got lots of room here. We're a big, large church. We can hold up to 200, 300 people here if we have to. We'd love to have you join us. Come and join us. It's a great place to worship and fellowship. Sing. And just praise God together. Good, friendly, low-key, very low-key. It's not, it's not a all get all dressed up place. You want to get all dressed up, that's fine. But we just come as come as you are. We'd love to have you join us here with that. Okay? And uh, let's close now. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we finish up this time of worshiping you, Lord, I put forth everyone this morning that has been with us, our friends, our active members, those who are hurting and suffering, and families at large. Lord, we ask that you may help us through the through with what we have shared with you this morning, and that you may bless those who require your healing presence and power in their lives right now, Lord. Lord, we trust you, dear Lord, for you are merciful and full of grace. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, you are a protector, loving Father. We always come to you for your protection. You have never let us down in all sorrow and peace. So today, dear God, we ask you to keep your peace amongst us. As we finish this time of praise, song, and prayer to you, we ask for your grace and wisdom as we head to the weeks ahead. Thank you for this blessing of life. Lord, may this prayer be a special request to you that we may grow and be impactful even in our small group and our communities. And dear God, we exalt your holy name. Thank you, God, for purifying our minds and our hearts with your words and setting us free from bondage. Thank you for the, for the good times that you've given us. Help us to find more time to do this again. And may we continue to walk in purity, peace, love, and joy. And Lord, let your name be glorified in heaven and in earth. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. We believe and pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, before we go, I want to thank you all for all you watching. I know I do this every week, but I love doing this. I have Randy, Brother Corey. Uh, Cindy, all you folks up in Victoria, I love you all. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you soon. Now you got Come and join us on Thursday nights if you get a chance. We'd love to see you then. I'd love to see you talk to you. Come and join us. Come and join us. And just take care. Have a blessed week ahead. Also, Pat, Pam, Erlene, Doris, man, these are the blessed saints of this church. And I love you guys so much. I thank you so much for watching us every Sunday. And we do this because we love you. And I hope you're getting a lot out of this. Man, take care of yourselves. We're praying over you. Just take care of yourselves. We love you so much. Okay? We really, really do. And for all of those that we haven't seen for a while, for all those you're watching for the first time, come and join us. Come and join us here at church. Okay? Or check in with us online again next week. Guys, the other thing I want you all to know, and this is important, uh, we've had ups and downs uh, watching online. Christmas time was amazing. <clears throat> but I want you to... Uh, online if you can click that like button i know i say that every week but it is vitally important that we get this message out to the people around the world and uh there's, there's no money involved in this this is just sending out the good news of jesus christ to the world we want people to hear this we want people to hear this 
And we love the only way. The, one of the ways the internet works, the YouTube works, and and Facebook is by clicking the like button. It's called an algorithm. It sets it up, and then they we are add to the recommended page, and so more people will get to see this these uh, these videos each week. So please do that. If you click the like button, subscribe to our church page if you can. Please do that as well. And each and notification button. So each time that the, that comes out, you'll be notified of a new one coming out each week. Please do that. Okay. So that would really be helpful to to just spreading the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world. That's what we're here for, guys. I want to thank you so much for watching again this week. It's been just a blessing each week to do this. I love you all. Have a blessed week. Stay dry. I don't know where you guys are living, but here in California, it's wet. It is wet. Stay dry. Okay. Keep safe. And I'll see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless you wherever you're at. Have a wonderfully blessed week. Okay. Bye, guys.